In this video, we want to learn the auxiliary point technique. This technique is used when we have a floating link mechanism, for which, we want to do a velocity analysis by constructing a velocity polygon. So, velocity polygon for a floating link mechanism using the auxiliary point technique is the title of this lecture. Let's use a typical example to understand how this technique can help. In this example, we have a link 2, which is pinned to the ground at O2. Link 3, connected to link 2, by pin A. Link 4, which is a triangle, and is pinned to link 3 at point B. Link 5, connected to link 4 at point C, and connected to the ground at O5. Finally, link 6, connected to link 4 at point D, and connected to the ground at O6. All the essential dimensions have been given, including the positions of supports O2, O5, and O6, the length and angle of link 5, and the lengths of all other links. As velocity information, the angular velocity of link 2 has been given. We need to draw the velocity polygon in order to find the velocities of points A, B, C, and D, and the angular velocities of links 3, 4, 5, and 6. Let's start the solution from the velocity of point A. Since we have the angular velocity of link 2, the velocity of point A can be written as this angular velocity times the distance from O2 to A. Here is the magnitude and the direction of this velocity is perpendicular to the line connecting A to O2. We bring it to the velocity diagram, starting from an origin OV. After velocity of A, the next point is B, and we can relate it to A. So, velocity of B is, velocity of B with respect to A, plus velocity of A. Velocity of point A is known. Velocity of B with respect to A is perpendicular to the line connecting B to A. But the absolute velocity of B is totally unknown in terms of both magnitude and direction. In fact, point B belongs to link 4, which is a floating link. A floating link is defined as a link for which we cannot find any points with known velocity. In case of link 4, none of the points B, C, and D have a known velocity. Let's check this definition for the other links as well. Link 3 is not a floating link since the velocity of point A is known. Also, link 2 cannot be a floating link because it has a fixed axis of rotation with zero velocity. That's also the case for link 5, which has this fixed axis, and link 6 having this axis. Because of link 4, which is a floating link, the whole system is called a floating link mechanism. And we use the auxiliary point technique for velocity analysis of such a complex case. Let's see how it works. We need to follow three steps. The first step is to discover the location of the auxiliary point. It must belong to the floating link as a rule. The second step is to find the velocity of the auxiliary point. And the last step is to use it to find the velocities of the other points of the floating link. So, the auxiliary point, which we call as P, belongs to link 4. But, discovering which point of link 4 can play the role of an auxiliary point is a bit tricky. Let's think about the velocity of point P. From one side, we can relate it to point B because of two reasons. Number one, because point B also belongs to link 4. And number two, because we can relate point B to point A, whose velocity is already known. From the other side, we can relate point P to point C, again because of two reasons. Number one, because point C also belongs to link 4. And number two, we know that the velocity of C is perpendicular to the line connecting C to O5. Note that points C and D are similar in this case, and we have the option to choose either of them. Now we can combine the two equations describing the velocity of P. So, from one hand, velocity of P is velocity of P with respect to B, plus velocity of B with respect to A, 
plus velocity of a, which we put here. On the other hand, velocity of p is velocity of p with respect to c, plus velocity of c, which we put here. Now, this relation should help us to select the right location for the auxiliary point p. As you see, we have six unknowns, specified by six little x signs. Let's take a look at the left-hand side of this equation. The velocity of point A is already known. The velocity of B with respect to A is perpendicular to the line connecting B to A. For the velocity of P with respect to B, we don't have any information. In order to reduce the number of unknowns, we want to combine these two velocities into one. This means that, we want the direction of the velocity of P with respect to B to be parallel to that of the velocity of B with respect to A. Because if these two velocities have the same direction, then instead of their individual magnitudes, we can just look for the summation of their magnitudes as the only unknown for the left-hand side of this equation. Now we should look for the location of point P. Let's assume point P is somewhere like here. We connect it to point B. The velocity of P with respect to B is perpendicular to PB. We want the velocity of P with respect to B become parallel to the velocity of B with respect to A. Let's see what location for point P must be chosen to make this happen. Looks like point P must lie on the extension of AB, but we don't know where exactly. Because for any point P on this extension, the velocity of P with respect to B is parallel to the velocity of B with respect to A. Now let's see what we have on the right-hand side of the equation. The velocity of point C is perpendicular to the line connecting C to O5. Again, for the velocity of P with respect to C, we don't have any information. So, similarly, to reduce the number of unknowns, we should combine these two velocities into one. We want the direction of the velocity of P with respect to C to be parallel to that of the velocity of C. Because if they are parallel, then the only unknown on the right-hand side is the summation of their magnitudes. To achieve this, point P must lie on the extension of O5C. As a result, point P must be at the intersection of the two extensions. Now that we've found the location of point P, let's see how this equation can help. We have the extension of the velocity of B with respect to A, which is this. And we have chosen the location of point P, such that the extension of the velocity of P with respect to B, which is this, becomes parallel to that of the velocity of B with respect to A. So, instead of two unknown magnitudes, we combine them into one unknown magnitude, which is the summation of the two. Note that, such combination can naturally be called velocity of P with respect to A, because it's like cancelling B with B, resulting in P with respect to A. The extension of the velocity of P with respect to A is also parallel to them, which we bring to the diagram, starting from the end of the velocity of A, because it is relative to A, and should be added to it, as the equation says. So, we are done with the left-hand side, and let's see what we have on the other side. We have the extension of the velocity of C, which is this. And the extension of the velocity of P with respect to C, which is this. Is parallel to that of the velocity of C. So, instead of two unknown magnitudes, we combine them into one unknown magnitude, which is the summation of the two. Such combination is in fact the absolute velocity of P, because kind of cancelling C with C yields just P. The extension of the velocity of P is also parallel to them, which we bring to the diagram, starting from the origin OV, because it is an absolute velocity. We call the intersection as P prime. This must be the velocity of P with respect to A. We can measure its magnitude. And this vector is the velocity of P, whose magnitude we can now measure as well. Note that, as this equation says, velocity of P 
is the summation of velocity of p with respect to a and velocity of a. A quick remark at this point is that we combine these velocities into this one. But now that we have found it, we cannot distribute it between them, simply because they are all parallel. Similarly, we combine these velocities into this one. And now that we have found it, there is no way to divide it between them, due to the same reason. To continue the solution, the velocity of this auxiliary point should now help us find other velocities. Note that, the auxiliary point cannot help any of the points that have already been used to compute its velocity, being points B and C in this case. So, apart from points B and C, the only remaining choice among the points of the floating link is point D, which is the next step. We can relate point D to point P by writing, velocity of D is velocity of D with respect to P, plus velocity of P. The velocity of P is known. If I connect D to P, the velocity of D with respect to P is perpendicular to it. We bring this extension to the diagram to be added to the velocity of P. On the other side of the equation, the absolute velocity of D is perpendicular to the line connecting D to O6. We bring this extension to the diagram, starting from the origin OV. That's what we do for absolute velocities. Let's call the intersection as D prime. Now we can find the velocity of D with respect to P and measure its magnitude. Together with the velocity of D, followed by measurement. From the velocity of D with respect to P, which is omega 4, times PD, from P to D, we can find the angular velocity of link 4. In order to determine the direction of omega 4, we can put the velocity of D with respect to P on point D to see in which direction it rotates link 4 about point P. Similarly, we can find the angular velocity of link 6 using the velocity of D, which is omega 6 times O6 D. And to determine its direction, we imagine the velocity of D on point D to find out in which direction it rotates link 6, about O6. The next velocity is for point C. We can relate it to D. The velocity of D is known, and we have it on the diagram. The velocity of C with respect to D is perpendicular to CD, which we bring to the diagram at the end of velocity of D. And the absolute velocity of C is perpendicular to O5C, which we bring to the diagram, starting from the origin OV. Here is the intersection, which we call C prime. We draw the velocity of C with respect to D, and then we measure for the magnitude. We do the same for the velocity of C, followed by measurement. Then, from the velocity of c, which is omega 5 times O5 c, we compute omega 5. For the direction, we imagine the velocity of c on point c to determine in which direction it will rotate link 5 about O5. And the last point is b. There are several ways to find the velocity of b, because at this point, we can relate it to any of the points a, d, and c. Each equation has three unknowns, two for the velocity of b, and one for the magnitude of the relative velocity of b with respect to a reference point. So, we need at least two equations. Let's combine the first two equations and put together their right-hand sides. On the left, the velocity of a is known. The velocity of b with respect to a is perpendicular to ab and we bring it to the diagram at the end of the velocity of A. On the right, the velocity of D is known. The velocity of B with respect to D is perpendicular to DB, and we bring it to the diagram at the end of the velocity of D. If the extensions intersect at B prime, here is the velocity of B with respect to A at this magnitude. And this vector is the velocity of b with respect to d at this magnitude. 
Finally, for the velocity of b, we can use either of the equations we combined. Considering the first one, velocity of a plus velocity of b with respect to a yields velocity of b. Then we can measure its magnitude. Likewise, from the second one, velocity of d plus velocity of b with respect to d also results in velocity of b. From the velocity of b with respect to a, which is omega 3 times a b, we can find the angular velocity of link 3. And for its direction, we can put the velocity of b with respect to a on point b and see in which direction it rotates link 3 about point a. So, at this point, we have found all the requested velocities, including velocity of a, velocity of d, velocity of c, and velocity of b. As well as all the requested angular velocities for the links 4, 6, 5, and 3. So, the solution is now completed. As a last remark, we might be interested in finding the individual magnitudes we combined. To refresh our minds, here is what we had. If you remember, we chose the location of the auxiliary point P, such that, these two items, become parallel, and we can combine them into one item. Then, after we found the velocity of P with respect to A, we could not distribute it between the combined items. Now that the solution is completed, and we have found the velocity of B with respect to A, we can simply take the rest as the velocity of P with respect to B. So, let's do the subtraction. Velocity of P with respect to A minus velocity of B with respect to A yields velocity of P with respect to B at this magnitude. For more clarification, if we take the velocity of p with respect to b and bring it to point p, we verify that it is parallel to the velocity of b with respect to a. That's also the case for the other combination we made. We combined these two items into this one. And after we found the velocity of p, we could not divide it between the combined items. But now that we have the velocity of c, the other item can be found by this subtraction. So, velocity of p minus velocity of c yields velocity of p with respect to c at this magnitude. Now if we take the velocity of p with respect to c and bring it to point p, we verify that it is parallel to the velocity of c.